Great. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our 27th session of the Met AI Group Exchange. This week, we have Rocky from Stanford with us to present her research on causal inference study design using assignment control plots. Rocky is currently a PhD student in bioinformatics program at Stanford, where she is advised by Michael Biocchi and Jonathan Chen and expecting to graduate in June 2022. Her research focuses on the development of simple data center tools and frameworks to design stronger observational studies in clinical informatics and clinical decision support. Thank you so much, Rocky, for joining us today. Before we start, do you have any preference on how you want to take in questions? Um, for this group, I think, so I will have some pauses for questions uh, okay. during the talk where you're definitely welcome to answer, uh, to ask questions. Uh, but also for this group, I think if, if you want to just ask a question, you'll have to unmute yourself and say the question because I won't be able to see chat probably. Um, you can go ahead and stop me and that'll be fine. Okay, great. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Rocky. Uh, great. So uh, thank you for the introduction and, and thank you for having me here. Uh, <laughs> it's exciting to get to talk to you guys. Um, I thought uh, I'd add to that introduction with a little bit about me uh, to kind of explain who I am. So uh, my name is Rachel Akins, uh, but you should call me Rocky. That's what I go by. Uh, and I'm a fifth year in the biomedical informatics program. And because bioinformatics is a really broad field, I want to specify that I am a collaborative biostatistician. Uh, and what that means is that I spend a certain amount of my time working on methodological work, like what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, but I also spend a portion of my time working on applied projects. So usually this will start with a content expert, maybe a clinician or a graduate student, uh, and they'll come to me with a really interesting question and maybe a data set in mind. And I get to be the lead statistician that helps make their study go and design their, their analysis plan. And the main, main reason I bring this up is because um, when you start working in the applied studies, uh, one way this has really impacted me is that it clearly becomes clear in this context that there is a huge cost to complexity when it comes to methods and study designs. And this cost kicks in way sooner than you think it will when you learn about something cool and interesting in a class. Um, and so as a methodologist, I've come to really value ideas that are simple and intuitive and communication tools that help reduce potentially <laughs> complex topics into things that feel intuitive. Um, did I hear someone uh, unmute themselves or All right, maybe that was someone coming in. And so, so, so with this inspiration in mind, before I tell you what assignment control plots are, um, here's a little bit of an outline for how the next 40 or so minutes are going to go. So I'm going to introduce some background and some motivation uh, and some causal inference underpinnings. I'm going to introduce assignment control plots. And then we're going to talk about some applications for these plots, some methodological stories you can tell with them. And then maybe if we have time, some other possibilities for future work. And so starting with the background and motivation, uh, my focus is going to be setting up the context and building the intuition for why we visualize assignment control plots. So this talk is going to focus on causal inference, specifically from observational data. Um, and I think this is in many ways a sister discipline to machine learning and AI, because they both often, often come up in the context of asking, how can we use observational data, data that we just have around, to improve the way we practice? And so in machine learning and artificial intelligence, we're often trying to predict what will happen or to characterize what is happening. Um, and causal inference focuses on using observational data to understand how to intervene, to change what is happening. And so more specifically, what we're interested in is the effect of a treatment or maybe an exposure and some outcome that we're interested in. And so to give you a concrete thing to think about during this talk, I'm going to use a guiding example that we're, we'll refer to a couple times. And it's going to focus on heart attack. So a particular pain point in the field of cardiology is that female patients have a lower overall risk of heart attack. But when a woman does have a heart attack, this patient tends to have a higher risk of mortality. And this disparity has gone on for decades. And so this is a complicated problem, uh, but there's some agreement that a large part of this probably has to do with diagnosis. Heart attack is an acute condition. It needs to be treated right away. And if you can't diagnose it, you can't treat it effectively. And so the reasons behind this diagnosis problem are also complex, 
But an important component of it is that women have different common heart attack symptoms than men. And some of these can be more subtle. So uh, often a woman having a heart attack might not have that, that uh, chest pain or tightness that we think of as being uh, so, so telltale of a heart attack sign. And some of their symptoms might be a lot more subtle and a lot easier to misidentify as something else. This is something we've only come to appreciate in the past couple of years. But a second part of this probably has to do with the fact that historically, inside and outside of the clinic, there has been a lot more focus on men with heart attacks and male heart attack symptoms in the way we represent and think about this disease. And so the importance of identifying heart attack in women and appreciating their risk uh, has really gone underappreciated. This study is gonna focus on an example by uh, Greenwood et al. looking at this diagnostic process. And so what this group of researchers noticed is that when a female heart attack patient arrives at a hospital, specifically in the emergency department, their probability of survival seems to improve if the attending physician they see in the ED is a woman. And their hypothesis uh, in this case has to do with this idea that maybe this time sensitive and stressful interaction in the emergency department uh, in this interaction, there's something to do with that shared identity of the female patient and physician that leads to a more effective turnaround of diagnosis and treatment. And so in this talk, we're gonna think about the question, do female heart attack patients have better outcomes when their treating physician is a woman? Specifically, you can think of in the emergency department. And before we go on, I do wanna mention upfront that when I'm using these words like female and woman, it can be somewhat ambiguous whether I'm talking about sex or gender. And the reality right now, unfortunately, is that medical data and often medical research doesn't necessarily measure or think about these things with a lot of fidelity. And so in applied studies, you will find that there are good researchers trying to study gender or trying to study sex, but they can have a lot of trouble coming up with a proxy that actually measures these things. So for the purposes of this talk, let's imagine that we're talking about gender, uh, but in reality, because we don't measure these things with a lot of fidelity, that can be a little hard to do in practice. But notwithstanding this issue, we might say that we wanna understand whether assignment to a physician who is a woman increases the probability of heart attack survival, specifically among female patients. And this is a causal inference problem from observational data. And what makes this or any other problem like this so tricky is that in an observational study, we, the researcher, don't get to assign who is treated and who is not. Individuals self-select into their own treatment group. And so an important task in any causal inference study is deeply understanding the baseline characteristics of treated and untreated individuals. Because we on the research team have to be constantly asking, how might my red treated individuals be systematically different at baseline than my blue, for example, untreated individuals in a way that could bias my estimate of treatment effect? Or for this example, how might the women assigned to a woman physician and the ED be different from the ones who aren't in a way that could bias my estimate of the effect. At various points in this talk, I'm also gonna suppose that we're interested in a matching study. And so I might have a matching scheme, for example, that says we're gonna take each treated individual and match them to an untreated unit that is very similar. And by just focusing on those matched pairs, we're gonna reduce the potential for bias in our comparison. And so what you might be thinking to yourself, uh, which is a perennial question of matching is, how do you know when you have pairs that are similar enough? And when I say similar, similar in what way? What's really important? And in matching studies and, and elsewhere, there's a very heuristic component to this process a lot of the time. You might start with some guiding ideas and maybe some information from a collaborator on what's likely to be important. And then maybe you iteratively work through a design or an analysis plan, tweak some items, check on it again. And this talk is gonna focus on how we might build the intuition we use in this process. And so in specific, we wanna ask what aspects of baseline variation in general are most important to a causal question? So some of you might already have some ideas on what might be a good starting point, but to build some intuition for everyone, I actually wanna start with this question, which is how do we protect against confounders? So, for example, if we were in an ideal situation where we got to design an experiment to answer our question, how might we would design the study against potential confounders? What you may be thinking 
And what many people often think when I ask this question is randomize. Uh, so we could, for example, flip a coin and assign everybody who gets heads to treatment, everybody who gets tails to untreated. Uh, and, and by being in charge of the assignment mechanism in that way and randomizing, uh, we can get a warrant for understanding treatment effect. But there's another component that's very dear to basic science research, which is this idea of control. And so, for example, if I were a plant biologist, I might compare two plants that have the same genetic background, the same amount of light, the same amount of water, and I just vary the thing I'm trying to experiment on. And so, in other words, by very tightly controlling other variables that might be influential to the outcome, I might be able to be able to understand a treatment effect, even if I didn't randomize. And so these two notions of how to protect against confounders actually make a lot of sense when we look at a causal diagram. So this is a classic causal diagram for uh, causal inference from observational studies. We might have some baseline variation here, often symbolized by X. Uh, and our particular concern with these baseline characteristics is that some components of baseline variation might influence the treatment assignment and the outcome. And this can cause confounding, which can cause bias. And so visually, that ideal of randomizing treatment assignment deals with this left arrow. And the ideal of controlling other sources of variability deals with that purple arrow on the right. And it turns out that the assignment idea has already gotten a lot of attention in the causal inference literature in the form of what's called a propensity score. Uh, so if you're not familiar yet with the propensity score, you should think about it as summarizing all of the variation important to treatment assignment. And the intuition here is by modeling the treatment assignment process, we can match or adjust for it and essentially decouple that green arrow in order to address that part of the confounding relationship and get to causal inference. Um, and in particular, the propensity score has been hugely influential because under certain assumptions, matching or adjusting based on a propensity score reduces bias due to measured confounders. But the propensity score is not all there is to baseline variation. That's just one component. And you might have an intuition when you're given a data set that there's something important that you measured that might not be the variation that is predictive of treatment assignment. And so in 2008, a statistician named Ben Hansen uh, derived a really interesting complement to the propensity score called the prognostic score. Uh, and so treated somewhat informally, the prognostic score summarizes variation important to the expected outcome. Uh, and so very analogously to the propensity score, you might think of the prognostic score as summarizing the relationship encapsulated by the purple arrow on the right between baseline variation and the outcome in order to decouple that part of the confounding relationship and get you to inference. And the propensity score and the prognostic score are sometimes called analogous because under a very simple, uh, a very similar set of assumptions to the propensity score, matching or adjusting based on the prognostic score also reduces bias due to measured confounders. But what's maybe even more interesting to me as a statistician is that prognostic score balance comes with these additional statistical properties that you can't get from propensity score balance. In particular, Matching or adjusting based on a prognostic score can increase precision or increase power in what's called a sensitivity analysis for unobserved confounding. Now, if uh, you're not in, usually working in causal inference, uh, and if you haven't thought about the prognostic score before, uh, it might seem like I'm throwing a lot of information at you all of a sudden. Uh, if you're interested, there is another paper on this, and there's another version of this talk I sometimes give, which goes deeper into the methodological context uh, and specifically talks about matching on the propensity score and the prognostic score. Uh, that paper will also give you some references to some really foundational work in this field. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, what's really important is that propensity and prognosis are these two different components of baseline variation that have distinct statistical properties. So now to internalize this a little more, we can return to our applied example of patient physician concordance and heart attack. Um, and we might ask, what are some items that might go into a propensity score and some items that might be more important in a prognostic score for this kind of a study? So I have some suggestions. Maybe, for example, uh, the year that you show up in the ED is really important if we're looking at a longitudinal data set uh, because the representation of uh, female physicians has increased a lot in the past 20 years. 
Um, maybe the hospital uh, you go to is important. Um, and maybe there are simple staffing things like what day of the week it is uh, that influences who your physician is likely to be when you show up at the emergency room. And so if we think about the prognostic score, maybe some of these elements show up again, right? The year you go to the hospital might have a big impact on what your outcome is because you know tech, medical technology is continuously improving and one would hope our outcomes are also continuously improving. Uh, likewise, the hospital might be important, but there are these other characteristics that might not be that essential for deciding who your physician is, but that might be really essential for deciding what your likely outcome is. Like for example, the age of the patient, uh, and whether you not, or not you have a history of cardiovascular disease. These could be really important and they would be totally ignored by a propensity score perhaps. And so one way you can think about this is that we're basically doing a dimensionality reduction. Mathematically, we start with some baseline variation encapsulated by X, uh, which potentially inc includes all sorts of different information, maybe the patient age, maybe medical history, maybe their home address. And the propensity score and the prognostic score are functions of X which summarize different components of it. And so when we think about this in theory, we might, we might consider the true propensity scores and prognostic scores and the functions that create them. And when we work with this in practice, we might make models for the propensity score and the prognostic score and then deal with estimated propensity and prognostic scores. But the inspiration for assignment control spots is, uh, sorry, assignment control plots is this idea that maybe a covariate space we're really interested in is the subspace of covariates important to the treatment, summarized by a propensity score, and covariates important to the outcome, summarized by a prognostic score. And so if you had a data set in front of you, what you might imagine is perhaps having an oracle give you the true propensity and prognostic scores for each individual, or estimating by hand the propensity and prognostic scores for each person. And then you could imagine plotting them in this two-dimensional space of propensity and prognosis. So to return to our applied example, this assignment control space, this propensity and prognosis space, might include the probability of having a woman physician on the x-axis. And then the y-axis might be something summarizing your risk of mortality. Um, this, by the way, is a great place uh, where you might think about using some of the more sophisticated modeling tools uh, that people often use in machine learning. But I think more generally in the medical context, what I want to underscore is uh, if you're thinking about an example, what will often be the case is that this uh, vertical axis is going to summarize how sick your patient is, and this horizontal axis is going to summarize how likely their patient is to be treated. And the reason I've been calling these assignment control plots, and the reason I'll sometimes call this assignment control space, uh, is that this horizontal axis has to deal with that ideal of treatment assignment, the randomizing assignment idea, and that vertical axis has to deal with that idea of controlling for other sources of variability that are important for the outcome. So that's why these are called assignment control plots. That's all about all I have planned in terms of background. I'm going to pause here uh, for questions if you have any um, things you want to clarify about the applied example um, or about what assignment control plots are and what they're plotting. Uh, now's a good time to check in. Um, I have a quick question for this mm -hmm. assignment control plot. Um, yeah. So I understand the x-axis is uh, using uh, the propensity score, right? And the y-axis is the uh, prognostic score. Um, but for this particular plot, is it, is it like um, gen general to other kind of scores as well? Like for example, you use, um, if there exists um, other scores measuring uh, pro, uh, the outcome, um, does it, work for other types of scores or is it uh, very specific to uh, prognosis score versus, uh, versus propensity score? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit in my future directions. I think there is a lot to be gained from visualizing different elements of baseline variation in different ways. Uh, the prognostic score and the propensity score are, are, are two elements to think about, and I think there's a lot of interesting interplay between the two of them, which we'll talk about basically for the rest of the talk. Um, but you're touching on something that's really interesting, which is that there could be more characteristics of baseline variation that we might be curious about. And for each new characteristic of baseline variation that we articulate, visualizing them together with the other thing tools we have can lead us to new interesting questions and, and new observations we might make about our data. Um, 
So, so that's great. And I'll, I'll actually suggest some other, like, not all, all of these are called scores often, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll introduce some other potential axes we could add to this plot or layer into these visualizations at the end of the talk. Got it. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So before we move on into some more detail, I do want to flag a particular nuance here that I'm not going to focus on specifically in this talk, um, which is fitting the prognostic scores. So um, the reason this is difficult is that the prognostic score, unlike the propensity score, is a model of the potential untreated outcome. Uh, and if we're being very careful about separating the way we design our study and the way we analyze our study, it's kind of forbidden to look at the outcomes of our subjects as we're in the process of designing our experiment. And so if you come from a modeling context, you might liken this to mixing your training and testing data. Uh, and so that other paper I mentioned a couple slides ago talks a little bit about pilot designs, which is one proposed way to get around this problem, essentially sacrificing some of your untreated observations up front in order to fit a prognostic score so that you can design a stronger study using the remaining observational units. So if you're curious about that, I'll have a link to the paper at the end of the talk. I also want to mention that for the most part in this next section, I'm going to make the common assumption that there is no unmeasured confounding. And now this assumption is a common underpinning of studies that use the propensity score matching or covariate adjustment. Uh, and so it's a really important starting point to get us all on the same page. But it is also one of the greatest weaknesses of these methods. And so we're definitely going to talk more about unmeasured confounding later in this talk. Uh, but with that, I want to refocus on assignment control plots and thinking about some of the interesting things you can do when you're in a position of being able to visualize propensity and prognosis. So we've really enjoyed these plots as an opportunity to think about some very core causal inference concepts in a new way. Uh, and lots of fun things have come to the surface. So next, we're going to go through some applications of assignment control plots, and then we'll think a little bit about some fun methodological stories you can tell. The first thing we'll talk about is using assignment control plots as a diagnostic. So uh, one thing that's already common in the literature is making propensity score histograms of your raw data before you do your analysis. And so here you might estimate a propensity score for treatment uh, on each individual and take a look at the distribution of, for example, your blue untreated individuals and your red treated individuals. And in particular, the reason this is important is to help diagnose how well your treated and untreated individuals overlap. Since this is essential for a lot of the theorems that, under, uh, that underpin the propensity score, not just in matching, but in a variety of other contexts. And so to give you an idea of what more we can add to this, here's an example of three data sets with qualitatively identical propensity score distributions. But when we start to look at the data in terms of the joint distribution of propensity and prognosis, we can see some differences between these data sets. And so now we'll imagine that we've estimated prognostic scores for each individual in our data set, and we're plotting the data with this additional dimension. So each red dot is a treated individual, and each blue dot is an untreated individual. And on this first data set, you'll notice that there is no correlation between propensity and prognosis, which means a treatment assignment actually isn't related to outcome. So if there's no treatment effect heterogeneity, and uh, our assumption is true that there's no unmeasured confounding, a naive comparison of treated and untreated individuals in the setting might do quite well. We could just take the average outcome of all the red dots and the average outcome of all the blue dots and subtract them and get a pretty good understanding of what the treatment effect might be. And you can compare that with this scenario. So this data set has a very high correlation between propensity and prognosis, which means a naive estimate could actually be very biased since the treated individuals are systematically different from the untreated ones in terms of their likely outcome. But you can take this a step further and notice that the direction of correlation might tell you something about the direction of bias from a naive comparison. Because in one case, we might tend to overestimate a treatment effect, and in one case, we might tend to underestimate it. And so returning to our applied example, we might imagine that in the center plot, this is the scenario in which the female physicians tend to get the riskiest patients assigned to them. And so there's, there's systematically sicker people in the treated group. And then the rightmost plot might be an example in which the female physicians get the least risky patients assigned to them. And you can imagine, and we can all think through, that in each of these scenarios, the direction of our bias is going to be different. In one case, we might tend to overestimate treatment effect, and in the other case, we might tend to underestimate it. But one methodological question I'm really curious about, for example, is whether this pattern can also indicate the likely direction and severity of bias for other designs that are less naive. So for example, if we ran a matching study, but our matches weren't exactly perfect. 
I also think there's a point to make here about generalizability which is that an assignment control plot might be able to tell you about what types of target populations you can and can't learn about. And so for example, we might be reasonably sure that we can estimate an average treatment effect for the people in this group, because we have a good number of treated individuals and a good number of control individuals that nicely overlap. But we also might be reasonably skeptical that no matter how clever we are, it could be really difficult to say what the treatment effect is for these people. And I think a general insight is that it's important to understand and communicate where you have the data to study a treatment effect and where you don't. And in particular, in, me in the medical field, we might be skeptical that a treatment effect estimated among maybe our healthiest people in the sample can generalize to the sickest people in our sample and vice versa. Another thing that's kind of interesting to think about is other joint distributions of propensity and prognosis and what those might mean for study design. So in the example on the left, that boomerang shape, shows a scenario where only intermediately healthy people get the treatment. Now, this probably doesn't apply to our heart attack example, but it might be more common in other medical scenarios uh, because there are lots of medical scenarios in which the standard of care changes depending on how sick your patient, are, your patient is. Maybe some more aggressive treatments are reserved for only the sickest patients, or maybe for the, our most sick and fragile patients, we like to scale back how aggressive our treatments are. Well, more generally, uh, what we've been excited about in this case is the possibility of using these plots to get a feel for your data even before you've necessarily done anything with it. Another scenario where these plots can be useful is after you've started to do something with it. So now we're going to talk about what we might do uh, after we've completed a matching. And so, for example, we might have matched on a propensity score and our matches might look like this. Uh, and these matches might help reduce bias due to measured confounding. But other matches might give us different statistical properties, for example. So matches that are close on the prognostic score might help increase precision, and they might increase power in those sensitivity analyses. And we can think through this in our applied example to really start to uh, internalize this, because these matches on the right, they're doing a really great job of controlling for the factors that determine who your physician is when you show up in the emergency department. But maybe these people that we're comparing they have different ages or different cardiovascular disease histories, which means their likely outcomes are different. And these things aren't showing up in the propensity score, so the propensity score matching algorithm isn't matching for them. So even though we've done a good job of accounting for the biases stemming from physician assignment, you might make a case for other matches that are closer in terms of those risk predictors we've left out. And so as a slightly more specific example, here I'll show you the same data set matched with three different matching schemes. Here's a matching approach which weighs all of the covariates equally with the Halanobis distance. And I actually think schemes like this can do quite well, except when some covariates are uninformative, which is the case here. And in those settings, this kind of matching scheme might actually get sort of sidetracked by those less important covariates and give you matches that are farther apart in terms of the characteristics you really care about more. Here is propensity score matching, and you can see like just like that schematic, uh, sometimes those propensity score match pairs can be prognostically very far apart because the propensity score is in some ways naive to those characteristics. Uh, and you can contrast that with this example where I'm using propensity and prognostic score calipers to really tightly manage the matching distances in this assignment control space. There's a ton more to talk about here, um, and most of it is in that other paper I mentioned. So for the sake of time, I'm going to avoid too much detail, uh, but I'm happy to talk more about it later. But one fun, fun item that is not in that paper is this note on propensity score overlap. So I mentioned earlier that overlap is really important for the theory that underlies the propensity score. And assignment control plots can kind of display how things can go wrong in practice. So here we have a propensity score matching that has sufficient overlap. And you can see that most of these matches are really close in, term, in terms of the propensity score and that they're nicely stacked right on top of each other. And you can contrast this with a situation like this, where the treated individuals don't overlap well with the untreated individuals. And so now the treated individuals that are very high on the propensity score become very hard to match. And the farther right untreated observations become in very high demand. And what this does is it forces these compromises where the untreated individual can be systematically, prognostically different than the matched individual. And that's going to cause bias. 
Um, so this highlights, I think, some of the ways that not having sufficient overlap can get you in trouble. Um, and it also ties into some interesting research that's done on what's called full matching or variable K matching that is a little bit more wise to this kind of problem. Uh, finally, in the applications, we actually did put together an example with an applied data set, um, and it's closely related to the heart attack example I introduced, except that we've tweaked it just a little bit. So uh, my lab's work is adjacent to cardiovascular surgery at Stanford, and so we looked at the more surgical-related uh, uh, question of surgeon and patient concordance in coronary artery bypass grafting surgeries. And the context is very similar. Uh, Coronary artery bypass grafting surgeries, or cabbage sometimes, uh, is a really high volume cardiovascular surgery, which is used to treat blockages in the blood vessels that supply oxygen to the heart. Uh, and very similarly to heart attack, oh, even though women are a minority of cabbage patients, they tend to have worse surgical outcomes compared to men. And so there's a very similar pain point here. And so we might be interested in asking whether matching to a woman surgeon increases the probability that a female patient will have a successful operation. Um, and so I'll mostly save the detail here for a paper, but to give you a little bit of a taste of what this might look like, um, here's an example of something uh, that's pretty common. It's called a love plot or a standardized mean difference plot. Uh, and these can show you how your treatment and control groups differ in terms of each covariate. Uh, so a point close to the black horizontal line means that the two groups are pretty balanced in terms of this covariate. And the points farther away from that horizontal means that there's like, many more treated observations with this characteristic or many more control observations with this characteristic. And this can help you pick on, up on imbalances, which are especially strong in your data. And so I kind of hinted at this in the beginning of this talk, but one thing that pops right out is that the year that your surgery is done, uh, drastic is a, is a great predictor of, of whether or not you're going to have a female surgeon. Um, and this is kind of unsurprising because the number of female surgeons has gone up uh, quite a bit in the last few years, although it's still very low. <laughs> um, and this might be something we might be worried about because uh, probably your probability of having a positive outcome is also related to what year you got your surgery because we continue to get better and better at taking care of our patients. But one thing you may be realizing about this plot is that when a data set contains a lot of features, it, this plot becomes kind of hard to read, and it can be hard to make a call on what imbalances are really important. And so this is where we think assignment control plots might contribute. In this specific case, we might be reassured that the treated individuals actually nicely overlap the untreated individuals, and there's not a super strong correlation between propensity and prognosis, so you, you might kind of notice that there is some. So we need to be a little bit cautious. That's about all I had for applications for this talk. Uh, there's definitely room to talk about more, um, but the next bit of this talk is gonna talk a little bit about some causal inference theory and some, some interesting methodological stories there. I'll pause again for questions, um, just in case anybody has any thoughts. Um, I actually have a question about uh, matching. Do you mind going back to the slide where we show um like pro, uh, matching by propensity or versus matching by um thinking yeah this one right here yeah um yeah i guess it's um so i'm wondering like when when does this matching happen like do you have um do you have a, like a separate like what you said pilot set for doing this matching and show uh, visualizing these plots and then of uh, in order to design like um yeah, design uh, the next observational study. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, did you did you have more to say? Oh no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that's a that's a great question. So the way the pilot design works uh, in the paper I laid out is uh, we set aside some of our data, and we're going to call this the pilot set. Uh, and then we're going to set aside another piece of our data. We're going to call this the analysis set. And the reason I call the pilot set the pilot set is because it's harkening back to this idea of like a, a pilot design in a randomized trial where we might run a pilot study. Uh, but our pilot set is going to be what we use to play around. It's kind of like you might imagine it's our training data. Mm -hmm. And so here in the pilot set, we're going to train really good prognostic score models and get like a good idea of what our outcome, what variables are important for our outcomes. Uh, but now that we've played around with this data and we understand kind of the outcome structure, uh, we have to get rid of it uh, because reusing that data is going to cause overfitting. And there are a couple 
couple uh, things that might happen down the line uh, that would go wrong with our estimation if we reused it. So we throw out our pilot data and then we take our analysis set. Uh, and that's what we use to complete the study. So now that we fit our great prognostic score, we can create these matchings, we can create these plots, um, all of this machinery becomes available to us. Um, there are actually, I think, a lot of ways you could apply this idea of the pilot design beyond just doing this like prognostic score fitting. Um, so I think it's a really interesting uh, avenue for research. And it's something that if you work in machine learning, this seems like very intuitive to you. <laughs> uh, but if you work in statistics, this is uh, this is machinery that we really have to work through, in particular because you have to like make that call that sacrificing those observations is going to give you a stronger study, which is something that a lot of people find really counterintuitive when they're working in statistics. Okay, got it. Thank you. That's a great question. Thanks. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and move along for time reasons. One thing that uh, we've especially enjoyed about AC plots is the way they open doors to some interesting new questions about causal inference methodology more generally. And so as a first example, we're going to return to that assumption I mentioned earlier about unmeasured confounding variation. Uh, remember, this underlies a lot of the statistical machinery we use when we work with a propensity score or with a covariate adjustment. And it's also going to be really important to assignment control plots in practice. So what I'll show you now is the kind of assignment control plots and matchings we might make if we had really good score models, but we were naive to some unobserved confounder in our data. And then I'll show you what these matches might actually look like in the true assignment control space, which includes the confounder. And so maybe here is our best attempt on the data we have in front of us. And we feel really good that we've done a great job. In our estimated propensity and prognosis, we've really tightly managed these matching discrepancies in this space. All of the matches look really close together. But maybe there's an unobserved confounder at play. And if we actually had an oracle that could tell us where each point was in the real assignment control space with the unobserved confounder accounted for, these same matches might make a totally different picture. And actually, they're very systematically different. And so schematically, this is what we think is going on. For our purpose, let's say the unobserved confounder produces this hidden pattern that we can't detect. And what's happening here is that the individual who is higher on that unobserved confounder is going to be up and to the right of the matched individual who's lower. And systematically, this rightmost individual is going to have a higher probability of being treated. So in this case, you're going to tend to be comparing sicker treated individuals with healthier untreated individuals. And so to kind of break this down even more explicitly, we think there are two visual components to unmeasured confounding. There's that vertical distance between matched individuals that are prognostically different. And the treated individual is more often the upper individual in the match. Or if you're interested in the opposite direction of bias, it might be the more often the lower individual in the match. So we thought this was a really interesting way to illustrate a very classic problem in causal inference, actually. Uh, and it came up again uh, in this next, next item I'm going to talk about, where we started to work on breaking down the treatment assignment mechanism. So I want to say that I'm speaking somewhat informally as I'm writing out the equations that you're about to see. Uh, things aren't always as neat as what I'm about to describe, but this scaffolding we found really useful for grappling with some of the questions we've run into. And so let's suppose that we were able to break down treatment assignment further into two functional components. The first of these is what we're going to call confounding variation. So these are factors that are important to treatment assignment, but they also have an influence on what your likely outcome is going to be. Um, that's why they're called confounding variation. And so these should feel very familiar. They're what you're always looking out for when you're working on a causal inference problem. The second of these is called randomizing variation. And these are factors which influence treatment assignment, but they actually have no direct influence on the outcome. And the reason I make this distinction is because confounding variation is harmful. It causes bias. It's what we're trying to correct for when we make a propensity score. But randomizing variation is helpful. It counteracts bias. And it's what we're using when we run a randomized trial, right? If we were to completely uh, be in charge of the treatment assignment mechanism, we would prefer for it all to be randomizing variation. It's going to all be exogenous to the problem. And so the way this relates to the point I just made is that randomizing variation is protective against both measured confounding and unmeasured confounding. That's why the randomized controlled trial is such an amazing tool. 
but we're in an observational context. And so we should continue to break this down into our measured and unmeasured components. And here's where we get to tie it back to some familiar machinery. Because we might argue that measured confounding variation is what we're trying to capture when we make a propensity score. And so one way you might tell the story of a propensity score-based design is that we're trying to neutralize measured confounding variation. And we hope that there is no unmeasured confounding variation so that randomizing variation can do its work and let us get to a causal, uh, uh, to causal inference. And so even though we don't really talk about randomizing variation explicitly very much in the propensity score literature, it's actually playing a really important role behind the scenes. It's what makes our study go. But we can actually continue to fill this out because you could argue that measured randomizing variation is kind of informally referring to what's captured by what's called an instrumental variable or sometimes an IV. And if you are not as familiar with what an instrumental variable in, is, this is kind of a good picture to have in your head. So you might imagine a measured characteristic that has a direct effect on what treatment assignment you, you're likely to have, but it doesn't influence the outcome directly. It has no direct effect on the outcome. And so there's a lot of complexity at IVs that I'm not going to try to explain during this talk, uh, but I do want to say that IV-based approaches, just like propensity score approaches, require their own set of assumptions uh, to get you to a treatment effect. And like all assumptions, these require a certain amount of care and skepticism. But one thing that's really interesting about the assumptions for IV-based approaches is that they don't require that assumption of no unmeasured confounding which makes them a really, it creates this really interesting synergy between propensity scores and instruments, I think. So to help illustrate these concepts, I'm gonna return one last time to our applied example. And now we're specifically gonna look at uh, ED physicians and heart attack. And so I'll jog your memory a little. Um, these were the components of baseline variation that we said might go into a propensity score. Uh, I'm going to take a, a drink of water and uh, maybe think to yourself, uh, which ones of these are more like measured confounding variation and which ones of these are more like measured randomizing variation? So, I'm sorry, hold on. Uh, so you might be noticing that year and hospital uh, these are strong candidates for potential confounding variation because the year you have you you arrive in the emergency department and the specific hospital you arrive in, those probably have an effect on both your likelihood of getting a female attending and your likelihood of having a positive or negative outcome. But day of the week might be something that's less related to patient outcomes directly. And so that might be something that behaves more like randomizing variation, more like an instrumental variable. Uh, and so I am aware that there is some evidence that certain days of the week are associated with better or worse patient outcomes in some settings. Uh, and so if we were really doing this study in practice, that might be an example of something we want to think really carefully about to make sure this is a real instrument. But for the sake of this example, let's imagine that we're comparing some days of the week that are functionally equivalent to outcomes, except that on, on some days there are more or fewer female physicians on site in the emergency department. And so my focus with this example more generally is just to talk through how, my, how we might think about identifying confounding versus randomizing variation in practice. So now that, now that we've set up this relationship, let's take this idea of confounding variation and randomizing variation and think what we could do visually if we could separate these components. So let's return to the assignment control plots I've been describing so far. And now let's imagine uh, we've separated out this treatment assignment access into a modified version of the propensity score, which just captured the measured confounding variation, and an instrumental variable access that summarizes the randomizing variation. Um, and I should say that in practice, because visualizing things in that three-dimensional space is hard, uh, what we've actually tended to do is just to project this three-dimensional space down onto the 2D planes for each combination of axes. And so, what you might notice is that this panel on the far left is pretty analogous to the assignment control plot you know by now. And the center and right panel show the relationship between your prognostic score and your new modified propensity score and an instrumental variable. But how might we interpret a plot like this? So we have some foundations to understand the different advantages for matching for nearness in terms of propensity or prognosis. 
But if we had an instrumental variable, what would we want to see on these two center and leftmost, or sorry, center and rightmost plots? So one of the first things we teach a lot of students in causal inference about matching is that you would love to exactly match on every characteristic. And we usually can't achieve that because it's infeasible. So let's think, would matches close in terms of the instrument also be a good thing? Um, and so in our applied example, we might think, uh, should we match subjects who came to the ED on the same day of the week, Tuesday to Tuesday, Wednesday to Wednesday? Um, is that similarity a good thing that we want in our study? Uh, and the answer really interestingly, I think is probably not. Uh, there have actually been a couple of people who've looked at this now and concluded that, for example, if you have an instrument, it should not go into a propensity score. Uh, and the reason behind this is that matching for nearness and an instrument can increase bias when an unmeasured confounder is present. And so we actually ran a small simulation study to look at this, and it turns out that when there's an unmeasured confounder at play, matching for nearness on an instrumental variable causes more bias than matching for nearness on another characteristic that is entirely noise. And so one way you could tell this story is to apply this concept that randomizing variation is helpful. It counteracts measured confounding and unmeasured confounding. And so when you match subjects to be near on an instrumental variable, you're quashing this randomizing variation, which otherwise would have been protected against your unmeasured confounding. To unpack this a bit, we can revisit our schematic from a couple of slides ago. Um, and remember, there are two visual components to unmeasured confounding. There's this vertical distance between matched individuals, and then the treated individual individual is systematically more often higher or lower. And what we think is that randomizing variation is protective because it disrupts the second item. Um, in particular, conceptually, if unmeasured confounding were the only variation left after you matched, you might be in a situation like this, where the treated individual is always the sicker one or always the healthier one. But when randomizing variation is present, it can occasionally overwhelm the strength of the confounder, and that's where you get matches where this pattern is broken. And this is what we think helps counteract the bias. So matching for nearness on an IV is maybe a bad idea, which is kind of interesting because it goes against some intuition that we teach causal inference students on day one, that the ideal match is similar in every way. But there's also a positive formulation here which is to remember that pure randomizing variation is actually something that is your friend. And even when you ignore it entirely in your matching, it's helping your study behind the scenes. Uh, so there, there are approaches that take this a step further. Um, one design that uses randomizing variation explicitly uh, is something called near-far matching, which keys in on this idea that you might prefer matched units to be near in terms of prognostically important variation, but far in terms of randomizing variation. Um, so hopefully this might be hinting at some of the fun methodological stories you can build uh, when you can start to visualize what's important to your causal question. Uh, we have a couple minutes left. I'm going to refocus on assignment control plots and a couple future directions. Uh, I'm going to pause here one last time for questions, and then I can take some more at the end of the talk. If there are no questions, let's, let's go ahead and keep going. Uh, so we're going to talk first about some co a couple ways we might extend these ideas further. Uh, the first item we're interested in is on the application side, characterizing the uncertainty in assignment control plots in practice. Uh, because remember, each axis here represents an estimated propensity score and an estimated prognostic score in practice. So you might imagine that in each of these plots, there might be intervals of uncertainty around where each point really is. And one thing that we think could be interesting about this visually is that the relative sizes of these confidence bars might tell you something about the relative confidence you should have in your propensity or prognostic models. And you might be even able to use this to inform how heavily you lean on one model versus the other when matching. But I also think this is an important reminder that assignment control plots are themselves estimated. And so if you're missing important information in your data set, assignment control plots will also be missing that information. And very importantly, if you are missing a really critical unobserved confounder, your assignment control plots also will be missing that variable. Another thing that I think would be really interesting to study is what, what uh, was hinted at in the first question we got, which is we can consider other dimensions that we might put into a plot like this. And, and, and the way you might think about this is these are dimensions of baseline variation, 
that could be informative to the way we study a causal inference problem. So the three that I've set up are the prognostic score, a propensity score summarizing whether or not you're likely to get assigned to treatment, and an instrumental variable axis. But there are more. And I think with each additional axis you add, you open the door to a lot of different questions and combinations with all of the existing machinery you've, create, you've created. Um, so maybe we're interested in understanding treatment effect heterogeneity. And so we want to study a candidate effect modifier. That could be a good axis to add. Maybe I'm an expert in generalizability and I wanna understand a, a different kind of propensity score, uh, but one that summarize the, summarizes the propensity for inclusion in my sample. Or maybe I'm running a randomized controlled trial, and so a propensity score for treatment probability isn't as important to me anymore. But what's really important now is compliance. Who takes the treatment they were assigned to and who doesn't? A last thing I'll mention that we're developing uh, is some work on science table plots, uh, which is a different kind of plot uh, that also visualizes some causal inference fundamentals and which we think might have really interesting applications to that treatment effect heterogeneity problem I just described. Um, but since we're running out of time, I want to bring us back to the central idea of this work, which is breaking down a potentially complex data set and visualizing it in terms of components that are distinct and meaningful to a causal question. So in this case, we looked at the propensity for treatment and the expected untreated outcome. But more broadly, what motivates this work is thinking critically about different functionally distinct types of variation in our data. Because I think this can give us foundations to not only design better studies, but to communicate about them more clearly and to identify future avenues for research. Uh, and that really is what inspires this work and the extensions that I'm most excited to see. So with that, there's a lot more to talk about for this project, um, and there's a lot more detail. Uh, this first link is the preprint uh, that this talk is about. And then the second one is this paper that I mentioned uh, that is some closely related but slightly more technical work. Um, so uh, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, and if you want to send me a question, my email address is also there. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Rocky, for this very interesting talk on assignment control plots and this this might be pretty new for a lot of us here uh, with like a uh, medical AI background. Um, is there any questions from any of the audience? I actually have uh, Raman, uh, sorry Raman, do you have? Okay, yeah, I actually have a question which I guess it might be pretty uh, obvious or like a uh, fund fundamental question. Um, but I'm wondering like, uh, cause you show that some of the variables that are considered as um, uh, like me uh, in the measurement side and some are like uh, randomizing variables. Um, like for example, you show examples of uh, the, hos the hospital as well as uh, the surgery year versus a uh, day in a week. So I, I wonder like in practice, how do you usually de de determine which variables go to uh, which side and yeah. Uh, that can be very, very difficult. Uh, and there's so there's a whole body of literature um, which uh, is often kind of separated from the propensity score literature on instrumental variables, which is really popular in economics. Um, and the fundamentals, sorry, I'm going to try and find a slide that we can look at that will help with this. Uh, so this might have to do with your question. Right. Um, how, how, do we, how do we get this to this place where we can sort, okay, year in hospital, these are confounding variation, and day of the week, that might be an instrument. Um, that's actually a really key part of, of like this whole discipline of economics that uses instrumental variables. Um, and in particular, the most important assumption that, that people try to think through is, uh, it's got a fancy name, it's called the exclusion restriction assumption. Um, and it basically is this idea that if you have something that you want to treat as an instrument, it shouldn't have any direct effect on the outcome. Right, so, so day of the week could be an interesting example here because you know we don't really have any reason to believe that if you show up at the emergency department on a Monday versus a Tuesday, that's going to profoundly affect your out outcome, at least we hope not. Um, and so that's that's the biggest thing, and it is actually the hardest thing to check. And, and even as I'm saying this, maybe you have a theory like, oh, everybody's sleeping on Mondays. I bet outcomes are worse on Mondays. 
Uh, and there are some niche, niche situations in medicine where, where that is actually true. Like you don't wanna have a surgery, I think it is over the weekend because of the staffing being different on weekends. Um, so, so you're keying in on actually a very difficult question. There's, there's a lot of work on, on trying to figure out whether or not this exclusion restriction assumption holds and how to know you really have an instrument. Um, and there's a lot of interesting work on figuring out how to take an instrument that's a little imperfect, maybe a little impure, and then, and then extract out the impurities to get something that really is randomizing. So, so maybe, maybe, for example, we don't want to look at Saturday and Sunday. We really think that those days of the week are different. But Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday Friday, you know, maybe we just happen to have more female physicians staffed on Thursday. And comparing Thursday with Wednesday, that's not going to be a huge difference in outcomes. So now we've we've created a nice instrument, uh, even though naively using day of the week, maybe maybe the exclusion restriction wasn't satisfied. That's a great question. <laughs> Lots of people have that question, <laughs> um, and it is kind of foundational, which is also fun. Great. Thanks. Um, is there any other questions? Okay, if not, let's give Rocky a round of virtual applause. Thank you so much for this uh, very, very uh, great talk. And yeah, and we will um, upload our re video recording to our YouTube channel later today. And if anyone else here um, has questions later, uh, please feel free to uh, directly contact Rocky or yeah, leave uh, your questions under the video or uh, the Google, Google Doc we have on our website and we will direct it to the speaker. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining yeah, us today. You. See you next week.